Great, thank you for the introduction and the invitation. It's great to be here. And I want to add my thanks to others, for the organizers, for putting together such a nice, uh, hospitable uh, few days, but also for getting such a really well-coordinated program. I find myself in the position coming at the end of uh, lots of bits of the view I want to present already having shown up in various people's talks, which is you know, a very nice position to be in. So what I'd like to do is start by locating what I'm going to say by reference to some things that other people have said, some other views. And I think, um, although the uh, more dynamic people aren't all here at the moment, uh, we could probably still identify these two broad approaches to representation with really a quite fundamental difference between them. So there's one camp that thinks that there's kinds of uh, intelligent, interactive ways of dealing with the world in quite complex ways that don't require representation at all. So we saw that in uh, Nico's embedded view, and we saw that in um, uh, Eric's, of course, um, radically, radically embedded view for uh, computation. And I think we saw that also in Albert's right at the very beginning, if you can cast your mind back. So there, it was a pro-representational view, but the thing that was establishing the power of representational explanation was the offline uses. It was this kind of relatively high-level thing. You remember the dog that uh, could deal with objects even though they weren't there and had the names for 938 different kinds of objects. So I think that's one kind of view, representation at the level of language or at the level of dealing with things in an offline way. <coughs> then there was another different family of views that says in the interactive case, intelligently interacting with the world, that's perfectly compatible with representational content. So think of Rebecca's view of emotions as these embodied action driving things, which as a result of that are representational. Or Andy's presentation of the predictive processing, where that's a way of dealing online with the world in relatively rich ways, but Andy was arguing supports representational content. So I'm in the latter camp. I think that uh, representation can arise in cases of intelligent online uh, dealing with the world, and then it can also be used offline as well. In fact, in a sense, I think that representational content arises automatically when you have the right kind of world-directed, world-involving behavior produced by the right kind of internal mechanism in a way that I'm going to try and illustrate. And then my question is, What's the right kind of organization, right? What makes it the case that there are representations? What makes it the case that things have the content they do? What are the facts about how a system's set up in its interaction with the world that determine content and doing that in a natural, naturalistic way? And then yesterday we had these marvelously contrasting views from uh, Bill Ramsey and Frankie Egan. I say they're marvelous both because they were so clear that you could see exactly where they disagree, but also marvelous for my purposes because of there being so much agreement really about uh, the basics of representation, right? what representational explanation is like, what game we're in, the kind of features that representational systems have. I think with that amount of convergence, uh, we can see that thinking philosophically about representation over the last 30 years has really made a lot of progress. Okay, but despite that convergence, there's this key thing that they were disagreeing about. Um, and I would like to agree with Frankie that representation arises relative to some capacity of a system, relative, as I'll put it, to some task being performed by a system. I think that's a crucial insight. But I also want to agree with Bill that that doesn't mean that representation is a kind of gloss or merely something that we can get at pragmatically. So you'll remember Bill argued, he said, well, say, take the case of vision, the capacity of people using their visual system to say, uh, pick out the edges and then sort of segment objects, and I'd add to then reach out and grab objects. That capacity is an objective thing about people. There's an objective reality to the visual system. And he went on, well, uh, part of the reason it's there is that it's evolved to be like that, and that gives it an objective reality that founds representational content in a way that's more than just pragmatic, it's more than just a matter of our interests for picking out this way of thinking about the system. So that's where I am. I agree with that. I think it's got a, that these tasks are important, these capacities are important for individuating content, and they've got a real reality to them. So I guess I can stop there and take questions. <laughs> <laughs> but I should probably give you a bit more. Anyway, that's locating my view. But I think that view does leave some, lots of questions open. I want to give you a bit more on one of the questions that it leaves open. So it leaves open, I think there's more to say about what kinds of capacities can ground representational content if you have this kind of capacity relevant relative or task relative, relative view. So I want to agree, the capacity of vision to pick out edges and then 
segment objects, and especially the, the way that it underlies the capacity to reach out and pick up objects. I think I agree that's a real capacity, and the fact that it's evolved to do that has probably got something to do with it's being a real capacity. But there are other capacities that the visual system shows which aren't relevant to fixing content. So take a set of paradigms that are studied when we study visual illusions, say. Right? There's a whole load of ways that people will behave when they're presented with stimuli. Their capacities in the sense that there's an input-output function that people will exemplify, but they involve reaching to the wrong place, like knocking over objects or reaching around the back of objects. Okay, so those are, why don't those kinds of tasks count as tasks uh, which fix representational content, because I take it that they don't. I take it that it's not the case that that kind of task is fixing a correct content that underpins performance of the task. And I think what Bill said about evolution uh, is an important insight. So um, uh, Tobias has given you a bit of my biography of right at the beginning of my studies, spending a lot of time studying with uh, Ruth Millikan, so I'm very sympathetic to the teleosemantic view. And I think it's quite right in some systems that evolutionary functions are giving you the task that the system's performing. That works very well where there are directly evolved behaviors, like in the classic evolutionary cases appealed to by teleosemantics, like animal signaling, like the macaque alarm call signaling that Gualtieri talked about yesterday. But I think there's these well-known limitations to appealing to evolutionary functions. So what I want to do today is to say we can get beyond evolutionary functions as the way, as the tasks that a system is performing. And I'm not going to make the arguments that evolutionary functions don't work, but let me just gesture in the direction of the worries that I've got. So, and they're just the two, two of the major concerns in the literature. And one is that um, we've got good reason to think that representational explanation doesn't depend upon facts that reached into the deep evolutionary history in many cases. So the Swamp Man case illustrates that, but I think it's not just a matter of intuitions. That illustrates a fact that we can uncover when we see how representational explanation works, say, in the cognitive sciences. So that's one line of objection. The other line of objection is it doesn't look like evolutionary functions give us specific enough functions to mesh with an account that gives us very specific, specific contents. So those are the two kinds of worries that motivate a, uh, a search for different kinds of tasks or functions with respect to which we can give content. And let me just give you a preview of my view of the view that I want to arrive at. So there's two broad ways of thinking about function that show up in the... Uh, in the philosophical literature. One way um, is often given the name goal-directed behavior, where goal-directedness doesn't presuppose that our representation is directing the behavior, but it's just a kind of pattern in behavior. So think of the way that a squirrel will go and get nuts out of a bird feeder. Right? You can see the squirrel running across the garden, and uh, uh, it comes down from the fence, it gets around something or other, it climbs up on a, on, a, on a washing line, say it falls off, it gets back on again, the wind blows it, it corrects, climbs up onto the feeder, things get in its way, it eventually manages to get around all the defences and get the nuts out of the feeder. So when we see that kind of behaviour, we can't help but see it as goal-directed. Right? There's something about that behaviour that um, looks like it's functional in some sense to us. And that's, I think, roughly like the first aspect of the Aristotelian conception of function. It's a behaviour that's directed at the goal in the sense that um, it achieves the goal and persists in getting towards the goal and can achieve the goal in the face of lots of perturbations and from lots of starting conditions. The second aspect of the broad, broadly Aristotelian view is that um, functions are behaviours or effects, uh, um, outputs that are performed because of the effects they achieve. So there's a kind of uh, because that goes from causes to effects. And, of course, that kind of teleological causation has always seemed mysterious until Darwin came along and showed us a way of thinking about it non-mysteriously, which is uh, this is a pattern which has gone on in the past, so these effects in the past are part of a, a causal reason why there's a system around now that produces effects, so what someone might call consequence etiology. So we can, get, we can make a sense of the idea of a consequence pulling out an appropriate behaviour if it's part of a historical pattern. So that's a way of making good on that, and naturalistically on that second limb of the Aristotelian idea. And the natural selection teleosemantic approach is on that second limb, and that makes, makes good function that second way. So the two things I want to argue for today, I want to argue that we don't have to choose between these two ways of thinking about function, that in mainstream representational cases, both are in place, and for good reason. There's a good reason why both are in place. And second, I want to argue that for the second limb, the way that we should think about consequence etiology, we are not limited to evolution by natural selection, but that there are other classes of case that give rise to function, and I'm particularly going to focus on 
outputs or behaviors that have contributed to persistence. <coughs> contributed to persistence. So that's the idea I want to do, to push for enlarging that. Okay, so that's the plan. I want to give you those, uh, that way of thinking about function and then give you an account, account of how it gives content its explanatory relevance. So let me just start by saying a bit more about the framework. Um, I don't need to say very much about this because, uh, as I said, um, for example, in Bill and Frankie's talks, there's a very similar framework, but I just want to be a bit more explicit about why tasks or functions are arising as central to the way that we think about content. This is a system that's studied to uh, do reinforcement learning in a certain kind of case. I don't need to w work through all the details. I'm just putting it on the board so that uh, you've got a picture of a system with a relative, relatively rich internal workings. And I think the way that representations get off the ground with this kind of system is that the, the system, the thing in the blue box here, <coughs> is performing some kind of function which is an input-output function characterized in terms of distal features of the world. So it responds to distal features of the world, like uh, grapes out there in the in an apparatus, and it responds to them by changes to distal features of the world, like it gets the grape and put it in, puts it in its mouth. <coughs> Other task functions might be moving to a lo new location or building a burrow, right? changes uh, that the system achieves in the world. So that's one bit. The other bit is that we've got some internal workings, right? This is the commitment to there being real internal vehicles of content. And here the internal workings are known about in some detail, so we know how firing rates, patterns of firing rates in different bits of the brain lead to other firing rates and eventually eventuate in behavior. So there's a story to be told just in terms of... Oh, you're not getting it. Just in terms of uh, sensory stimulation here leading to patterns of firing here, which interact with patterns of firing here to produce patterns of firing here and so on, and so you get bodily movement. So there's a complete causal story here that doesn't mention content. That's the sense in which we know the mechanism. So here's a sketchy way of saying how content arises. Once we've got a task that this system is performing, then as well as the kind of local properties of these vehicles, these vehicles really have some other properties. <coughs> They've got relations between them and things in the world. And in this case, the relevant relations will be the relations of correlating or carrying correlational information. But another real property of this system embedded in this particular environment is that this thing correlates with the delivery of reward. Um, and this thing here correlates with an action that the uh, organism produces. So those are further facts about these internal workings, relational facts, um, but additional facts over and above the description of how firings lead to firings. And my thought is, the common thought, I, I think, just a version of the common thought, that representational content is a special kind of constellation of these internal workings facts with these relational facts. I like Peter Godfrey Smith's way of putting this. He says, these internal components can stand in exploitable relations to things in the environment, where the mechanism exploits those relations in order to perform some behavior. Here, the exploitable relation that it's making use of is the correlations between internal things and things in the environment. Another exploitable relation is the one that Bill was talking about yesterday, which is having a structure that's isomorphic to some structure in the environment. That's another relation that can be exploited. So we've got a task being performed by the system, we've got an internal mechanism non-representationally conceived, but then we've also got the, relational, the real relational properties of bits of the mechanism. And uh, content is some constellation of those relational properties such that those internal features having those particular relational properties <coughs> allows us to see how this internal mechanism is an algorithm or a computation for performing the externally characterized task. And that's why externally characterized tasks are key here. So let me just spell that out on a slide. The framework's got some external embedding, which is a task being performed by the system. It's got internal elements bearing exploitable relations to distal features of the environment. And then representational explanation gets off the ground because processing over vehicles with those relational properties is a way of achieving the distally characterized function. So my question for today is which kinds of functions can play this, the role of setting up this framework? And as I've kind of hinted at, I'm pluralist about that in various ways. So uh, one way of being pluralist is I've been focusing on real cases in subpersonal information processing psychology, so from cognitive neuroscience and psychology, but where there's no question of the representations being conscious or they're being available to verbal report or the kind of things people would give as reason. So um, 
I'm assuming that when we get to those kind of representations, there are going to be extra complexities that are relevant to fixing the content of those representations. But this is being offered as a, a sufficient condition, a story, an account of content in some of these simple representational systems, but the thought isn't that it has to be a, condition, a necessary condition or a condition that applies to the personal level. And there are also two other dimensions of variation which will give rise to pluralism. So I mentioned that uh, there's at least two p potential exploitable relations that, that might be relevant, correlation and isomorphism. And then uh, uh, I've been arguing that there's more than one notion of function that can give rise to content. So evolutionary function is one for appropriate kinds of systems, but I'm not going to argue today that there's another kind of, uh, other, there are other kinds of functions that also get content off the ground. So that's going to lead to a pluralism about content. There's uh, a variety of different ways that um, systems can have representational content. Now you might say, well, isn't there some overarching theory that covers all of these? And I don't want to positively argue that there's not, because um, I haven't got a positive argument that there's not in my back pocket. But um, I think a trouble with trying to get a theory that covers all the cases is that it then tends to overgenerate. It tends to cover all kinds of things that aren't representational, and you lose some of the explanatory bite. And I don't see any particular reason why we should expect there to be a single theory that covers all the different things that uh, have a broadly representational way of giving an explanation. So I think just starting with a pluralist assumption that we could explain representational content in one system one way, and that doesn't constrain us in uh, giving a slightly different explanation of representational content than another, but that's a, that's a profitable approach. <coughs> okay, so now we're going to move on and um, focus on this question of functions. And there's a preliminary question, which is how should our theorizing be constrained? And if we look at the philosophical literature on functions, there's two main sources of constraint. There's intuitions about cases, right? You give a case, you give an account of functions, you say, oh, intuitively it's malfunctioning, or intuitively it's not really functioning. Uh, that's one constraint that's been used, and the other is trying to recapitulate the way that function talk is used <coughs> in, in biology. And I think neither of those ways is going to be um, suitable for me because I'm interested in what notion of task or function can work for psychology. So I can't appeal to other, either of those. So how am, I, how am I going to constrain the theorizing? Well, I think there's something about representational explanation that's relatively uncontentious that I can appeal to here. So in going to case studies, in going to looking at how representation um, explanation is used in psychology, there's a very broad constraint that I think we can use, which is, as a philosopher, we're trying to understand how that explanation works as it does, and although it could turn out, when you look at it, that representation isn't really needed, it's OTS, it's spinning its wheels, in a lot of cases, what you'll discover is that we can make representational explanation intelligible. That's, the, that's to say, we're aiming to understand what representational content is, such that this practice of explaining behavior by finding contents in the system is intelligible, makes sense, gets its explanatory purchase. And that leads to a desideratum, which uh, I think can guide our theorizing about function. So here it is. The desideratum is that an account of how representational content is constituted in some class of systems to show why recognizing the representational properties of such systems enables better explanations of behavior than would be available otherwise. So that's the thing I'm going to use to constrain my theorizing about functions. And in the background here, of course, is the, 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 the problem, the tension, um, <coughs> that if you're committed to real vehicles of content, there's always going to be a complete causal story about how the system operates that doesn't mention contents at all, because there's going to be a mechanistic story about those vehicles. One of the cases that's been used in the literature to illustrate that is the, um, the rifle firing mechanism. So here there's a complete causal story about how this mechanism works that goes from moving your finger on the trigger to the trigger lever moving a certain way uh, to releasing something here which causes the firing pin to move, which hits the cartridge, which causes the propellant to explode, which causes the bullet to come out of the muzzle. So there's a complete step-by-step -step causal story. That's always gonna, there's always going to be a causal story like that in place if you think there are real vehicles of content. There's something else about the story that you get in the case of the trigger, which is that uh, uh, any way that you uh, have of carving up these internal workings marches in step with the inputs and outputs. So the inputs is movement of the finger, the output is release of the, release of the bullet, and the internal workings just march in step with those inputs and outputs. So you could factorize an account of what this system does by just taking uh, external world events seeing how it 
leads to some pattern of input, how that chugs through some internal events, and how that leads to a pattern of output. I think in representational cases, typically, we can't factorize. That's to say, although we could give a complete causal description, um, uh, the patterns that the representational explanation pick out aren't just the same as the patterns that you would give if you pointed to a complete causal description. So I want to come back to that when I've given my account of functions <coughs> to show why it might underpin some kind of explanation that doesn't lead to this kind of simple factorizing. Okay, so now I want to say why, why it is I think that um, a representational explanation getting its explanatory bite should lead us to a certain notion of function. And that's because I think there's a real pattern in nature. There are three things that tend to go together. We find them in representational systems, and they go together better than chance and for a natural reason. And the first two are, the, are two elements of Aristotelian teleology, as I, as I uh, introduced it. So the first one is cases where some outcome or range of outcomes is achieved robustly. In the, sense of, in the sense that I had with the squirrel, that there's an outcome that's achieved from lots of starting positions across lots of different perturbation. So that's the first thing. I think that often goes together with that disposition to produce outcomes robustly having been produced itself by a stabilizing process of some kind. Let me give you a non-representational illustration of that. So in development, like the development of an organism, ontogeny, there are various outcomes that are incredibly important to development. So one of them might be the folding of the neural tube. And because those are important to development, and under pressure through the stabilizing process of evolution by natural selection, what's happened over evolutionary time is that lots and lots of ways of achieving that outcome have evolved. There's lots and lots of backup mechanisms, lots and lots of mechanisms that come, come in to make sure that outcome is achieved across lots of different conditions. So that development doesn't get interfered with by changes in conditions. So that's, that's a stabilizing process, evolution, that leads to robustness of outcomes, leads to the production of lots of different routes to the same outcome. And I think natural selection can do that in the representational case too. Um, another stabilizing mechanism is deliberate design. So if uh, some deliberate designers are getting together and designing a mechanism to produce some outcome in the world, then they can design lots of backup mechanisms to make sure that outcome isn't um, fragile, isn't, isn't disturbed by the kind of variations you get in normal environmental conditions. So I want to argue today is that learning is another thing like that. Learning is another stabilizing process that can lead to outcomes being produced robustly. Not just that a good outcome is produced, but that as a result of cycles of learning, there come to be ways of producing that outcome more robustly. So then we have a historical explanation, either an evolutionary one or a much more proximal uh, learning-based one, <coughs> how it is that a mechanism comes to have the capacity to produce outcomes robustly. So I think those two things go together better than chance. There's a good reason why, when there's a stabilizing process focused, at, if you like, on the production of some outcomes robustly, why that's a mechanism over time of producing uh, systems that do so robustly. Right? The stabilizing giving, is giving rise to the robustness. Now, not all cases like that have to be representational. Well, the developmental case, I take it, is usually not representational. There are just a whole load of different mechanisms. But I think a lot of cases where you get this stabilizing process producing robustness, there's also a synchronic explanation as to how that robustness is produced, like a here and now mechanistic explanation, that involves having internal components keyed to distal features of the environment in such a way that we get an explanation of the mechanism producing those things robustly. That's to say, I think having representations as the means of getting the outcomes robustly is the third element of the cluster, often goes along together with these other two elements. And then it's not just by chance, it's not that, uh, or it's not just interest, rel interest relative. There's a real feature about the world that when you've got stabilizing mechanisms focused on outcomes that uh, thereby generate a disposition to produce those outcomes robustly. Uh, it's reasonably common that a mechanism arises for doing that using internal components that correlate with or stand in exploitable relations to things in the environment as a way of doing that. So if that's a real natural kind, if that's a, I mean, it's a natural kind in a loose sense, but if that's a real pattern in nature um, where those features come together for a reason, then we get a lot of explanatory purchase by identifying instances of this. So just uh, analogously, 
Uh, if I take a physical object, um, I know some things about it as a result of its being a physical object that allows me to make some predictions. But if that physical object happens to be um, uh, Anne Jacobson's cat, say, happens to be a biological object, then I can get much more specific predictions. And I think this is like that. Because these things go together, when you identify some features of the cluster, the others are likely to um, be there. So this, the existence of this cluster in the world gives representational talk its explanatory bite. OK, so that's how I'm going to argue that representational explanation gets um, its explanatory bite. Now I need to be a bit more specific about the two elements that go into these functions. And I'm going to use the label task functions for functions that have got both these elements. A task function is when something uh, has a robust outcome function on the one hand, and it's got a persistence function on the other. And I want to say a bit more about what those two are. So start with the, uh, here's my natural cluster of properties. Um, so task functions is when, the, when you've got the robust outcome, uh, and I'm going to tell you what robust outcome functions are and persistence functions are. So first, robust outcome functions. Uh, I've given you the squirrel example. Um, uh, a lot of you will know that our disposition to recognize behaviors as goal-directed arises quite early in infanthood and uh, seems to be a, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, this is a sideline, but seems to be important in the development of autism, which is why it was uh, studied by uh, Frith and Happe here. So these are little animations just using geometrical objects, but because of the way the objects move, it's very hard to avoid seeing the objects as being um, uh, directed, goal directed, or directed as an outcome. So the fact that we have this psychological capacity doesn't yet show that there's uh, a real category in nature that it's getting onto, but it at least hints at it. And this is the category of nature of robustly produced <coughs> outcomes. Um, I think another good example of what it is to robustly produce an outcome uh, can be seen by looking at uh, motor control, the, li the literature in cognitive neuroscience about how motor control is carried out. <coughs> So, I, um, in motor control of reaching, uh, the way that people will reach a target has quite a lot of robustness in it. So here's one kind of robustness. If the target is moved after you've initiated a reach, then uh, the motor trajectory is kind of automatically connect corrected so as to still be able to reach the target. And that's what we see with this setup here, this <coughs> change. If, that, if, if it's surreptitiously moved during a saccade, people won't even realize they're making the adjustments, so the motor system is set up to make these adjustments. So that's a way of consistently reaching the target, which is robust across some variations that go on during production of the action. You can also do it from lots of different starting points. You can also displace the whole system by changing the input or changing the output. So you can change the input by putting prismatic goggles on. And if a subject puts prismatic goggles on and then tries to reach for a target, if the goggles move all the input 15 degrees to the left, then they'll end up reaching 15 degrees to the right of the target. But the system has the kind of robustness that allows it to retune over a few reaches so as to reach the target accurately again. So that's some robustness in, the, in, the, um, uh, in producing the outcome when the input changes. You can also change the output. So you can put people in an artificial force field so that as they reach their arm is under some kind of forces that are different from our ordinary gravitational forces. And again, people will initially get the target wrong, but over time, the sensory motor disposition adjusts so as to reach the target again. So that kind of robustness, I think, is well characterized by an old view of function, um, Ernst Nagel's system property view of function, uh, where he says to have function in this sense, which he calls goal directedness, is a matter of being able to reach uh, a certain outcome from a range of different starting positions and uh, across a range of different perturbations. So that's one thing. There's a, the, this other aspect, the change in the motor output, the changes if you change the motor contingencies by, say, putting in an artificial force field. I think that's a, a different thing that's not yet captured in Ernst Nagel's view, but is picked up in Dennis Walsh's view. So he says another aspect of robustness in this sense is that the agent has a repertoire of actions and performs actions that are appropriate to producing the outcome. So I don't think robustness requires this. So think of a, um, 
a case like this. You've got a rough crater um, and you've got a little ball. Now, if the little ball just has a disposition to shake, then it'll produce a robust outcome. It'll reach the bottom of create the crater from a lot of different starting positions and despite the bumps in the crater. But it's not doing that by doing different things from different places. Right? So it doesn't have what Walsh would call a repertoire of behavior. That's unlike the motor case, where we have got a repertoire of behaviors and we adjust so as to produce behavior that's appropriate to producing the outcome. So I think we should think of robust outcome function as having both of these features of robustness. So I'm going to <coughs> define robust outcome function in this way. A system has a, has a particular output, f, as one of its robust outcome functions, if and only if it produces that outcome in a range of different external conditions, where the range can be a matter of initial conditions or perturbing conditions, and also it produces that through a range of different motor outputs. Okay, so that's the, the first aspect of task function, the robust outcome function. Now I want to talk about the second aspect, the, the consequence etiology. Um, this initially mysterious idea that the behavior is produced because of the outcome that it leads to. I think for a long time that seemed wrong-headed, except in the kind of conceptual or representational case where you could understand um, what it was to produce an outcome because of um, the effect it produced, because uh, that effect was represented. But in the non-representational case, it was hard to understand how it could be that uh, an outcome could draw out behavior that's appropriate to its production. But of course, Darwin and then um, uh, in the philosophical literature Wright gave us an account of why that's completely unmysterious. And this is Wright's account of functions. He says, well, it's not mysterious how it is that uh, an appropriate effect, an effect appropriate to a certain outcome should be produced if that's part of a pattern where that same thing's happened in the future. So he produced a, de a very broad definition of function based on that, where a function is a matter of uh, a consequence produced by a system where the system is there in part because it's produced that kind of effect in the past. Now, of course, there are lots of classic objections to this as an account of function, which I think show that it's a very, very liberal account. So I think it's not suited to my purposes, because I doubt that function in this sense fall into my nice cluster. That's to say, I doubt that just meeting this condition is enough to give rise to the disposition to produce outcomes robustly. But nevertheless, I think there are other things that fall in this that do produce these, tend to produce these robust dispositions. Evolution by natural selection is one, and I want to argue that there's other kinds too. And the particular kind I want to point to is contribution to persistence. So one that doesn't depend on an evolutionary history, just depends about, on facts about the particular organism, that individual organism or that individual system. And I think learning are the clearest cases of that. So think about uh, learning to get food, learning to get the grape. If there's a learning mechanism in an individual, that for whatever reason is directed at getting food types, like getting grapes, then uh, over time it will adjust what it does so as to make it able to get the grape and then over time to adjust to be able to make it able to get the grape in a wider variety of conditions or across different kinds of perturbations. And then I think we've got an explanation that has roughly this form. If we want to understand now why this thing has the disposition <coughs> to get grapes, or even the disposition rough, robustly to get grapes, then we can explain that by looking at a pattern that's occurred in its little parochial local history. And that's a pattern of producing the outcome of getting grapes in the past. That's part of a causal explanation as to why this thing is around now with its disposition to get grapes. It's part of a causal explanation in that case because there was a learning mechanism in place that was directed at gra getting grapes. That's to say, the reinforced behavior that did lead to getting grapes. But we can have the same with, in that, in that case, the learning mechanism looks like it has an evolutionary function. But we can have the same with cases where it's not at all clear what the evolutionary function of the learning mechanism is. As is well known, you can make people do learning experiments for money. So that here's one based on motor reaching, where the <coughs> green and red circles stand for money you're going to get at the end of the experiment. People have to reach, they get a hundred cents for landing in the green circle, they lose a hundred cents for landing in the red, and you can see over time people's behavior adjusts so as to reduce their motor noise to try and land in this portion. 
So if we want to ask, of this individual, June, who's just performed the experiment, uh, how come she's got the disposition to point like this? Well, we can point to her just recent causal history. It's because she did some pointing with this kind of pattern in the past, in the recent past, um, and that's part of the cause of her having this more tightly focused disposition now, of her having this more robust disposition now. So I think we can say all of that without having to give an account of why the learning mechanism is as it is. We've got one of these consequence etiology kinds of accounts because there is a learning mechanism, but it doesn't turn on what the learning mechanism is directed at or the function of the learning mechanism or how the learning mechanism has evolved or otherwise. It just requires that there is a mechanism such that <coughs> doing the thing in the past is part of an explanation as to why it's around now with its disposition to do it now. Okay. Um, I've argued for that, that pattern being in place in the case of learning and also being of the right kind, those kind of persistence functions being of the right kind to give rise to robustness. Now here's something I'm much less sure about, I'm interested in people's opinion of. Take a case where there's not a learning mechanism, um, but it is true that the effect that was produced in the past is just a cause of the system persisting. So the great case could be like that. Suppose that the monkeys happen not to have a learning mechanism for getting grapes. But nevertheless, this little monkey, let's call him Fred, has eaten some grapes in the past. They've kept him alive. And now he's still around with the dis disposition to eat grapes. Right? Then I think we do have an explanation that has this structure. As I said, a very liberal structure. If we want an explanation as to why there's a, a system around now with the disposition to get grapes, Part of a causal explanation of that is it got grapes in the past. So I think it fits this. So then we've got a kind of function that's just causal contribution to persistence. Not persistence of the disposition, but persistence of the system that has the dispositions. The question that I th is still an open question for me is whether that is enough to get into the cluster that also involves robustness. And that's just an empirical question. Is it empirically the case that contribution to persistence of a system over enough cycles, over enough time, can be a mechanism whereby that outcome gets stabilized, that outcome comes to be produced more robustly? If it is, then we'll have another way of getting task functions off the ground, which would give rise to representational content. If not, then my pluralism still gets going, because I think the learning case is different from the evolutionary case. Um, but then there's just one. So these are the two ways I have of thinking about persistent functions. The one that I'm more sure about and the one that I'm less sure about. So I want to say an output produced by a system is a persistence function of that system, if and only if producing that outcome contributed directly and systematically to the persistence of the system with its disposition to produce F, either by contributing to the persistence of the disposition, that's the learning case, or this case which I'm much less sure about contributing to the persistence of the system itself. Now the positive reason for thinking that might be in is because it fits the right recipe, the consequence etiology recipe, so in principle it could be a mechanism for making something more robust. But the reason for, the reason for caution or maybe even skepticism is that I don't know of empirical cases that have that kind of structure. If I go into the the case studies I've looked at in psychology and cognitive neuroscience all have a richer structure than just persistence. They've got, they've got um, uh, 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 learning going on too. But then there are other bodies of literature. You've got the, uh, say, the predictive processing literature that looks at not just the brain, but the brain and body as a uh, homeostatic system which is doing error minimization. Right? That's a way where you might think that persistence of the system is... This, is um, the stabilizing mechanism, uh, and you've got, I think, quite a clear account of function from Christensen and Bickard, which looks at function in terms of contribution to persistence. So that's at least a very clear way of specifying it. So I think there's an issue here, or there's certainly an issue for me, as to whether this gives rise to real empirical cases that have this, this roughly this structure. Okay, so the final thing I want to do is to say what happens when we have these functions in place. So just to 
uh, remind you, this is the kind of function that I think can, uh, can be part of the story of underpinning representational content and arises when you've got the constellation of both robust outcome functions in my sense and persistence functions in my sense. So I'm going to call that having a, a task function, a task um, to which representational explanation can be directed. <coughs> so now I want to go back and say how task functions of this kind are part of what underpins the explanatory purchase of representational content. And I'm going to do that again by re reference <coughs> to the motor, motor system. So here's a picture uh, of the kind of computations being done in the motor system for that online error correction that I showed you. The correction to behavior that goes on when you shift the target while the, while the agent's reaching. And this has got uh, an important part of it, which is this uh, internal prediction and modeling, um, which is an important part of why this behavior is robust, why it can be done robustly in real time. is because uh, it doesn't just depend on sensory feedback, but it involves this kind of internal loop. So that's going to be really important to why this is a robust outcome function. But for the purposes of explaining how content gets an explanatory purchase, I don't think I need that bit. So I'm going to give you a really toy system that leaves that out. But because my toy system leaves it out, it's only going to be representational in a very... It's going to be a very marginal case of representation. Right? So maybe I'll step back a bit. So as I've defined robust outcome functions and persistence functions, they both come in degrees. An outcome can be more or less robust. It can be robust in the face of smaller or greater variations in conditions in the world, across a wider and smaller range of initial conditions, using a wider and smaller range of different bodily movements. And similarly, persistence functions, like right? the, the stabilizing process could be more or less powerful, more or less important explanation as to why the system is as it is. And the clearest cases of representational content will be with robust you know, outcomes that are robust in a strong sense where the stabilizing process has been powerful. But those features can be in, case, in place in marginal cases, and then you'll have more, more marginal cases of representation. So the system I'm giving you now, this little toy system, I think it's going to be marginally representational for those reasons, but it illustrates the different components. So here's, what the, here's the little toy system. It's the thing in the blue box, and it has a very simple pattern of behavior. It moves along a one-dimensional line, uh, and it'll move along that line from any starting point and arrive at this notional position with the black dot, the target T. That's just a, a notional position. That's a mark of where it arrives at. And it does it using a very simple mechanism, uh, like a comparator mechanism. It has an internal state that correlates with where it is along the line. It has another internal state, which we may think of as a target state, which is a fixed state. It calculates the difference between these using a mechanism. Maybe it just compares the firing rates and calculates the difference, and then it produces a correlate of that difference. And it transforms that into a motor program using some kind of linear transformation which then is used to drive the velocity of the wheels. So you can kind of see this is just going to mean that uh, the direction of the wheels are moving and the velocity of them is going to correlate with how far away it is from this target. So the behavior of the system will be that it moves initially rapidly and then more and more slowly in, towards the target until it reaches the target and stops. And I think this exemplifies the characteristic pattern of representational explanation. There's a task that's being performed by the system there's some internal workings that we can understand entirely mechanistically, but if we want to understand how that is a computational algorithm for performing the distally characterized task, we can do so if we see the worldly relations of correlation that these internal components stand in. And then we get explanations of success and failure. So suppose a bit of grit gets in the system, so this no longer correlates the way that it standardly does, then the system won't arrive at T, it'll arrive at some other place and stop. And we can explain that through misrepresentation here. Right? It usually correlates. This is an occasion where uh, it no longer stands in that correlation relation. So we've got misrepresentation explaining <coughs> failure. So far, I haven't said anything uh, about uh, why this should have persistence functions. You can see it's got a certain kind of robustness in reaching T but uh, y is reaching t a persistence function, let's add a feature to the toy system so as, we, so as we can get persistence functions into the picture. Let's suppose that there's a power source at t, and this thing needs power, so that uh, it'll move around, and it'll, quite soon it'll stop, unless periodically it gets to t where it can recharge. Okay, then now if we add that into the picture, then 
if we want an explanation as to why this thing is around now with its disposition to reach T from a range of different starting positions, then part of the explanation of that is that this thing, this very system, has reached T in the recent past, right? Because it's needed that to get power to be around now with its disposition. Okay, so now um, let's um, test whether this whether representational explanation is uh, getting its power from our task functions. And let's think about a swamp system to try and illustrate that point. So suppose this little system uh, assembled, its, assembled itself by chance on someone's work sh workshop bench. There was an earthquake in San Francisco and uh, an engineer in San Francisco uh, had some bits lying on her bench and they fell into place to make one of these, one of these things. Uh, then it would move around the bench along a line so as to reach a certain position robustly. You moved it away, it would move back. You got in the way, it would stop. You got out of the way, it would move there. So it would have the robust disposition um, but it seems to me we wouldn't have explanations of success and failure yet for this swamp system that's just come apart by chance. So let's suppose some, something gets into the system, so this gets changed and this gets changed. And so instead of having the robust disposition to reach T, it has the robust disposition to reach some other place, T prime. Now we have two different kinds of explanation. We could say, well, it's systematically representing, misrepresenting where it is, and so it gets to the wrong place. Or we could say, no, this is just a system with a different disposition. It's got the disposition to reach T prime, and it does that by correctly representing where it is with different contexts. I think for the swamp system, we will have an intuition that, that there's no fact of the matter about whether it's correctly representing so as to get to T prime or misrepresenting so as to get not to get to T. And I think that's because there's not yet enough in the picture to underpin a fact of the matter there. So, so I think our intuition that there's a no fact of the matter about correctness in the case of the swamp system is tracking the fact that we don't yet have the cluster in place, the cluster that gives rise to the explanatory power of representational content. But now let this swamp system interact for a while, and it, it's one with a battery. Let it interact with the, the workbench, and suppose there really is a power source at T. So now we've got the swamp system, and it's moved around for a few days. Uh, and it's been able to continue moving around just because it was lucky enough to have the disposition to reach the place where the power source is. Now if we want to understand why there is this system around with its disposition to reach T, although there's quite a lot of accidental features to it, we do get an explanation of it's having this disposition, which appeals to the fact that it's reached T in the recent past. So I think this is a case where Reaching T in the recent past has contributed to the persistence of the whole system, and so it's given us a thin, but a kind of explanation as to why we've got a system now around with this disposition to reach T. So when I said um, I wasn't sure about whether mere persistence could get into the cluster, uh, if mere persistence gets into the cluster, then this would be a case, but it would be a relatively marginal case. I think we can do the same with a swamp macaque. So, so imagine a swamp man that's a macaque, comes into existence, it has the disposition to reach and get grapes, right? And let's compare that to a swamp macaque that comes into existence and has the disposition to reach and get things that are 15 degrees to the right of a grape. At the stage where they've come into existence by chance, um, I can't see anything yet in the picture that can underpin a sense in which uh, reaching the grape is a kind of success, whereas the disposition to reach 15 degrees to the right of the grape is a kind of failure. But as soon as these things have interacted with the world for a while, then the one that's got the grapes will have had that disposition contributing to its persistence. So now there is an important difference, I think, between the two cases. So that's why I think that both the persistence condition and the robust outcome function are playing an important role in founding uh, a notion of success and failure which misrepresentation is suited to explaining. Finally, let me say uh, why I think we get rid of factorizing here. So go back to the rifle firing pin. Uh, so as with any vehicle case, this will always be a case where there's a complete causal explanation in terms of patterns of sensory stimulation and bodily movements. But we can't factorize its behavior simply into some things going on into the world. They produce uh, stimulation here. That produces a chain of internal work and that produces output here. And I think we, the reason we can't factorize it is because there's a kind of bridge at both the input and the output side that 
makes for a pattern relating internal elements to distal features of the environment that's multiply realized in terms of proximal stimulation <coughs> or proximal following movements. And that's because when there are robust distal outcomes, then the outcomes produced through a variety of motor mechanisms and the output outcomes produced in a variety of situations, that's to say, given a variety of input stimulation. So those two features which I said were important to what it was to be a robust outcome function, producing the outcome in a range of different external conditions and producing it through a range of different motor outputs, I think mean that we're not in a firing pin, a rifle firing pin case, where the world involving explanation just walk, walks exactly step by step in hand with the internal components explanation. We've got an internal component explanation that kind of bridges across a variety of things going on at the level of sensory stimulation and that bridges at the output across a variety of things that can go on at the level of motor movement. So that's why when you have things that fall into this cluster, representational explanation is giving you a kind of explanation that generalizes across things that would be visible just from the point of view of intrinsic properties of the system. It's giving you a, a kind of way of clumping these things into a different set of patterns that gives explanatory purchase into understanding the task being performed by the system considered distally. Okay, so just to uh, summarize that, I've been arguing that there's a real pattern of nat in nature when robust outcomes are produced in a way that historically depends on some stabilizing mechanism. That's to say, if we want to know why the system has some robust outcome, outcome function dispositions, there's an historical story involving persistence to be told, but also there's a synchronic explanation, an explanation of how it does it in terms of, as you might say, with shorthand representations, or you might say more long-windedly, long it does it by having internal components that stand in exploitable relations to distal features of the environment. I think because that's a real pattern in nature, representational explanation gets a distinctive kind of explanatory grip, and it shows us why uh, appealing to representations allows for better explanations of the behavior of the system than would be available otherwise. So I'll stop there. Thank you.